Ever notice how light is the first thing we see when we're born? It's like the universe saying, welcome. In just a few weeks, we start recognizing faces and things with the help of this friendly light. But here's the cool part. As we grow up, we find out that light is not just there. It's kind of mysterious. You can't touch it, but you can see it everywhere, especially from the sun. All stars produce light. Even though light is super important for life on Earth, we don't know everything about it. Scientists have been puzzled by this invisible thing for a long time. So in this video, we'll check out how holograms are made, learn the secrets behind your sunglasses, and even figure out why the speed of light is the way it is. Join us as we dive into experiments that shine a light on the stuff that brightens up our world. Newton's Prism and Pink Floyd Would you believe me if I told you that the iconic Pink Floyd album cover, The Dark Side of the Moon, shares a profound connection with Sir Isaac Newton? The scientist, renowned for his groundbreaking contributions to physics, conducted a historic light experiment alongside his work on gravity and the development of a unit of force. In the 17th century, the field of optics was going under rapid advancements, captivating the curiosity of numerous scientists and philosophers interested in the connection between light and vision. He devised a clever approach by creating a minute aperture in a piece of wood to isolate a slender ray of light. Guiding this isolated light through a prism, he observed its refraction onto a white surface. During this stage, he discerned distinct colors, particularly noting the presence of red and blue at the edges where the ray struck the paper. Isaac Newton's renowned light experiment is celebrated for its ingenious twist, involving the introduction of another prism. Redirecting the light emerging from the first prism into a second prism, he achieved the reconstruction of white light. Newton deduced that while the first prism had refracted the light, the second prism had effectively converged the rays, resulting in the appearance of white light. In essence, this experiment demonstrated that the colors observed during light refraction through a prism were inherent properties of light, dispelling the notion that they were a consequence of contamination. Before Newton delved into his experiments with light, the prevailing belief was that light originated as white and the various colors observed in refracted light, such as those appearing when light passed through the glass, were attributed to contamination by the material it had traversed. For centuries, the prevailing belief was that light consisted of discrete particles, or corpuscles. This particle theory, championed by luminaries like Newton, shaped our understanding of light. However, as the scientific lens sharpened, the limitations of this view became evident, promoting a need for a more comprehensive theory. Young's Double Slit Experiment and Fresnel Lenses In the 19th century, Auguste Jean Fresnel and Thomas Young brought about a significant change in our understanding of light by supporting the wave theory. Young's famous double slit experiment in the early 1800s provided strong evidence for the wave-like nature of light, challenging the prevailing article-centric view and paving the way for a more nuanced comprehension of light. Fresnel, despite not being well-versed in the existing theories about light, was fascinated by diffraction, the bending of light around objects. His breakthrough came when he observed colorful bands produced by a diffractor and realized that covering part of it made the colors disappear. He developed mathematical formulas to predict the positions of these bands and later used them to foresee interference patterns from light reflecting off mirrors. In 1819, the French Academy of Sciences announced a prize for the best work on diffraction. Despite facing a well-renowned judge, Poisson, who supported the particle theory of light, Fresnel submitted his comprehensive theory just before the deadline. To everyone's surprise, Poisson used Fresnel's theory to predict a bright spot in the center of the shadow when parallel light hit an opaque disk, confirming the wave theory. This unexpected turn of events led to Fresnel winning the Grand Prix marking a significant victory for the wave theory of light. Fresnel continued his work in optics, designing remarkable lenses that found extensive use in lighthouses until the mid-20th century. These lenses also made their way into car headlights for a time and are still employed in taillights, backup lights, solar cookers, and lighting for film and theater. Not only did Fresnel's lenses produce brighter beams, but they also offered more uniform light intensity, 
leaving a lasting impact on the field of optics. The other guy, Thomas Young, was no less of a genius, and his experiment strongly inferred the wave-like nature of light. Because he believed that light was composed of waves, Young reasoned that some type of infraction would occur when two light waves met. Young's experiment was like a clever game with light. He thought if light acts like waves on water, it should behave in a similar way. Imagine two ripples meeting at a pond. Sometimes they make a bigger ripple, and other times they cancel each other out, leaving a flat surface. To test this idea, Young came up with a smart experiment. He used sunlight that passed through a tiny slit to create a source of neat and organized light. Then he directed this light onto another screen with two slits side by side. The light passing through these slits landed on a third screen. When the slits were big, spaced far apart, and close to the screen, two overlapping patches of light appeared. But when Young made the slits smaller and brought them closer together, something cool happened. The light passing through the slits created colorful bands separated by dark areas in a specific order. Young called these bands interference fringes. He realized that only waves could create these colored bands, showing that light behaves like a wave. How was this even possible? The explanation is quite mind-blowing. When light hits the twin slits, it splits into two new wave fronts that perfectly match each other. This happens as the light passes through the slits. For a point like A on the screen, the waves from each slit need to travel the same distance to reach it. This ensures that they are still matched or in the same phase when they reach point A. When these two waves meet at point A, they create a bright interference fringe on the screen due to constructive interference. However, points like B on the screen are not equidistant from the two slits. The light traveling from one slit to reach point B has to cover a greater distance than the light from the other slit. Imagine the slit and point B on the left side of figure 1. The light from the closer slit, let's say the one on the left, reaches point B a bit earlier than the light from the farther slit, the one on the right. As a result, these waves don't arrive at point B at the same time, out of phase, leading to destructive interference. This creates a dark interference fringe on the screen. It is important to note that interference fringes aren't limited to the double-slit setup. They can happen in any experiment where light splits into waves that either cancel each other out or combine. Later on, more experiments were created to show how light behaves like waves and exhibits interference effects. Young's experiments strongly supported the wave theory of light, but that did not last long. Did you know that the creation of holograms relies on the principle of light interference? When two beams of light overlap, they can either amplify each other or cancel each other out, depending on whether their peaks and troughs align. This is known as constructive and destructive interference, respectively. To make a hologram, a laser beam is split into two, the object beam and the reference beam. The object beam is directed onto the subject, the object being recorded, while the reference beam is directed straight onto a recording medium. As the object beam reflects off the subject, it carries information about the object's features. The two beams then intersect on the recording medium, creating an interference pattern. This pattern is a result of the interaction between the waves from the object beam and the reference beam. This interference pattern, recorded on a photosensitive surface, contains detailed information about the amplitude and phase of the light waves. To view the hologram, a light source, often the same laser used in recording, is shown onto the developed holographic plate. When the reference beam encounters the recorded interference pattern, it reproduces the original object wavefront. This recreation results in the perception of a three-dimensional image, complete with depth and perspective. Holography finds applications in security features, art, and education, thanks to its ability to produce intricate and lifelike three-dimensional images. Amazing, don't you think? Single Photon Double Slit Experiment In Young's experiment, originally a full beam of light passed through the slits. But then someone had a curious thought. What if we sent only one photon at a time through the slit? Imagine making a light beam so faint that we could observe the effect of just one photon on the screen. Surprisingly, in experiments where researchers carefully sent only one photon at a time towards the wall, the interference pattern persisted. It seemed as if a single particle was somehow interfering with itself. 
This concept alone is mind-boggling. Strangely, when a detector was placed by the slits to record which slit each particle passed through, the interference pattern vanished. Instead, two lines of light appeared on the screen, just as expected if point particles and not waves were passing through. It was as if the act of measurement changed the nature of the particles. The paradox of light behaving like a wave but being detected as a particle is at the heart of Richard Feynman's introduction to the basics of quantum mechanics. He notes that this phenomena is impossible to explain using classical methods, making a mystery that cannot be eliminated by understanding its workings. We choose to examine a phenomena which is impossible, absolutely impossible to explain in any classical way, and which has in it the heart of quantum mechanics. In reality, it contains the only mystery. We cannot make the mystery go away by explaining how it works. In telling you how it works, we will have told you about the basic peculiarities of all quantum mechanics. The double slit experiment, despite its simple concept, remains one of the most intriguing tests ever conducted. It has been repeated with both light and matter particles, showcasing the fundamental strangeness of quantum mechanics. The experiment illustrates the concept of wave-particle duality, suggesting that both light and matter can exhibit characteristics of both particles and waves. Additionally, it introduces the superposition principle, revealing that particles can exist in multiple states and even simultaneously occupy multiple places. In the double-slit experiment, particles aren't confined to traveling through just one slit or the other. For interference to occur, each particle must be simultaneously traveling through both slits. Einstein's photoelectric effect and Planck's quanta. Einstein himself acknowledged that meticulous experiments could reveal whether light behaved as particles or waves. In 1905, he delved into the photoelectric effect, a phenomena discovered two decades earlier by scientist Heinrich Hertz. Hertz observed that shining ultraviolet light on a metal plate could induce sparks. The surprising part wasn't the emission itself. Metals were known conductors, and electrons could be dislodged by an energy burst. What puzzled scientists was that different metals required bursts of varying minimum light frequencies for electron emission. Interestingly, increasing light brightness produced more electrons without boosting their energy. Additionally, higher light frequencies generated electrons with greater energies, but the quantity remained unchanged. The mystery lingered until 1905 when Einstein's paper on the photoelectric effect was published. Einstein proposed that light consists of particles and photons whose energies are linked to their frequencies. When this particle beam collides with atoms on a metal surface, the collision causes the photoelectric effect. The energy carried by the light particle is proportional to the frequency of the wave, and conversely, the wave's frequency is determined by the particle's energy. Einstein's groundbreaking work on this topic earned him the 1921 Nobel Prize in Physics, marking just the beginning of significant developments. It's crucial to note that without Max Planck's study, resolving the problem of blackbody radiation and introducing the concept of discrete packets of radiation, or quanta, either absorbed or emitted by single atoms, Einstein wouldn't have been able to explain the photoelectric effect. Planck's insights laid the foundation for Einstein's groundbreaking contributions to understanding the nature of light. The photoelectric effect finds a lot of applications in the modern world. Take solar cells, for instance. In these cells, incident light photons interact with semiconductor materials, liberating electrons through the photoelectric effect. This liberation generates an electric current, effectively converting light energy directly into electrical energy. This process forms the foundation of solar power technology, enabling the harnessing of sunlight for a sustainable and renewable energy source. On the other hand, photoelectric sensors, widely employed in industrial settings, leverage the photoelectric effect for object detection and automation. These sensors utilize incident light to create a signal through the photoelectric effect facilitating precise control and manufacturing processes. This application showcases the photoelectric effect's role in enhancing efficiency and accuracy in various industries, contributing to advancements in automation and technology. Hey, before moving on, 
Be sure to like or dislike the video so that we can improve it for you, the viewer. Plus, don't forget to subscribe to our channel by making sure to hit the notification bell so you don't miss any of our daily videos. As you can understand, a series of experiments on the nature of light triggered a paradigm shift in our understanding of reality. This transformative period altered the course of science, prompting scientists to re-examine past experiments and search for clues that would contribute to a groundbreaking theory of light. This emerging theory challenged our existing knowledge and paved the way for the development of quantum theory. Since those pivotal moments, science has never been the same, and the exploration of light has opened up new realms of understanding. Speed of Light But let's leave behind the dual nature of light for a moment and focus on another of its intrinsic properties, speed. The speed of light, a fundamental constant denoted by C, holds a special place in the realms of physics. Defined precisely as 299,792 kilometers per second, this speed is unique in that it remains constant across all inertial reference frames. Unlike other velocities, it doesn't change, regardless of the motion of the source or observer. This means that if you're on a train moving at a certain speed and shooting a bullet forward, you'd add the bullet's velocity to the trains to determine its overall speed. However, this logic doesn't apply to light. Whether emitted from a stationary or moving source, light maintains its constant speed. Now let's explore how scientists first managed to calculate this unchanging speed of light. One of the pioneers in this endeavor was Romer, a Danish astronomer who conducted a remarkable experiment to estimate the speed of light. Romer, stationed at the Paris Observatory, stumbled upon the speed of light by chance. His focus was on retrieving precise observations of Io, one of Jupiter's four largest moons, discovered by Galileo in 1610. By precisely timing the ellipses of Io caused by Jupiter, Romer aimed to enhance our understanding of the moon's orbital period. In the 17th century, such observations had practical significance, as they were considered celestial clocks for navigators and mapmakers worldwide. These clocks, based on the orbital motion of Jupiter's satellites, were intended to provide a means of determining absolute time, aiding in calculating longitude. Although this method ultimately proved impractical and was discarded with the advent of accurate seagoing timepieces, Romer's work unexpectedly unraveled another crucial scientific mystery, the speed of light. Io's orbital period is now recognized as 1.769 Earth days and it experiences an ellipse by Jupiter once per orbit when viewed from Earth. Romer's extensive observations over the years revealed a curious phenomenon. The time between successive ellipses varied systematically. As Earth moved closer to Jupiter in its orbit, the time interval shortened and, conversely, it lengthened as Earth moved away. Romer discerned that these fluctuations were unrelated to the relative positions of Earth and Jupiter. In a brilliant insight, he attributed the time difference to the finite speed of light. Essentially, when Earth and Jupiter were on opposite sides of the Sun, light from the Jupiter system had to travel a longer distance to reach Earth compared to when they were closer together. Romer estimated that light took 22 minutes to traverse the diameter of Earth's orbit. The speed of light could then be determined by dividing the Earth's orbit diameter by the time difference. Christian Huygens, a Dutch scientist who performed the same calculations, arrived at the speed of light equivalent to 131,000 miles per second. While this value differed from the correct speed of 186,000 miles per second, the discrepancies were attributed to errors in Romer's estimate for the maximum time delay and imprecise knowledge of Earth's orbital diameter. Despite the numerical differences, Romer's data marked the first quantitative estimate for the speed of light setting the stage for further advancements. However, the discoveries on the speed of light did not stop there. On a more theoretical note, scientist James Clerk Maxwell found a measure of the speed of light by studying electromagnetic waves. His set of equations, known as Maxwell's equations, described the behavior of electric and magnetic fields and their interactions. In the process of formulating them, Maxwell identified that his equations predicted the existence of electromagnetic waves. These waves were analogous to light waves but existed across a broader spectrum, encompassing radio waves, microwaves, and more. 
Maxwell recognized that the speed of these electromagnetic waves, denoted by the symbol C in his equations, was related to the electric permittivity and magnetic permeability of free space. Later, experimental measurements such as Romer's and Huygens' ones confirmed the accuracy of Maxwell's predictions, cementing his place in the history of physics. Maxwell's speed of light equation has been conceived in the framework where light propagates through free space. However, when light encounters a medium like air, water, or glass, its speed changes. This change happens because light is made up of tiny particles called photons. As light enters a medium, these photons interact with the atoms and molecules in that medium. It's as if light is playing a game of catch with these particles. Each time a photon is caught, absorbed, is then thrown, re-emitted. This process causes a delay in the movement of light through the medium. Due to this delay, the overall speed of light within the medium is reduced compared to its speed in a vacuum. The refractive index is a measure of this reduction, indicating how much the speed of light is decreased in a specific medium. Different materials have different refractive indices. In real life, you can observe this phenomena in everyday optics, like how light bends when it enters water or how lenses work in glasses. Even natural phenomena like rainbows are a result of light dispersion in raindrops, showcasing varying speeds of different colors of light in water. The speed of light isn't constant in different mediums. It changes based on the interactions between light and the particles in the medium. Understanding this is crucial for comprehending optical phenomena in our daily lives. Dirac and the Three Polarizers Paradox In this video, we're discovering that intriguing phenomena unfold when we manipulate light. Fresnel, known for his fascination with lenses and light, was well aware of this. Even the renowned scientist Dirac found himself facing a paradox while experimenting with polarizers. To grasp the concept, let me elucidate what a polarizer is. Remarkably, a polarizer is a device used to polarize light, typically made of a material or filter. It permits light waves vibrating in a specific direction to pass through while blocking those vibrating in other directions. The common type aligns the electric field vectors of light waves using a special material. Polarizers find widespread use in optical devices like sunglasses, camera lenses, LCD screens, and other systems requiring control over light polarization. Modern sunglasses often incorporate polarized lenses, featuring a special filter to reduce glare and selectively block certain light waves, enhancing visual clarity and reducing eye strain in bright conditions. Now equipped with this knowledge, let's delve into the three polarizer paradox. Shine light through two polarizing filters oriented at 90 degrees, and no light passes through. However, insert a third filter between them at a 45 degree angle, and surprisingly, some light manages to pass through. This experiment, often deemed strange, is commonly discussed in the context of quantum mechanics, showcasing its apparent spookiness. Nevertheless, it can be explained in a simple cause and effect terms without invoking quantum magic. Consider the standard experiment. Unpolarized light passes through a polarizing filter, registering strongly on a light meter. Introduce a second filter at 90 degrees and no light passes through. Now, place a 45 degree polarizer between them and the light meter records a significant amount, though less than in the initial setup. Seems mysterious, doesn't it? The perceived spookiness arrives from a misinterpretation of the term filter. Traditionally, a filter is seen as blocking some items while leaving others untouched. Yet if our so-called filters not only block components but also alter them, the addition of new filters causing items to pass through isn't surprising. A polarizer, as mentioned earlier, does just that, altering light waves. No need for spooky quantum properties. It's a straightforward cause and effect chain yielding rational, comprehensible results. Are you still there? If so, why don't you take a moment to think about the beauty of these experiments? What's your favorite so far? Let us know in the comments below. Compton and Rayleigh Scattering It's important to note that not all scientists were initially convinced that light could exhibit both wave and particle characteristics. This skepticism led scientists from diverse backgrounds, countries, and time periods to conduct their own experiments in an attempt to better understand the nature of light. 
Among these scientists was Arthur Compton, who discovered Compton scattering, a physical phenomenon providing evidence for the particle-like nature of light. In this process, photons, light particles, collide with electrons, transferring energy to the electrons and causing a change in the wavelength of the scattered photons. Compton's observations supported the notion that light possesses both wave and particle properties, contributing significantly to the development of quantum mechanics. In his experiments, Compton used X-rays and directed them at a target material containing electrons. X-rays, being a form of electromagnetic radiation, just like visible light, radio waves and microwaves, only of much higher energy, collided with the electrons in the material. What he observed was crucial. When these collisions occurred, some of the energy from the X-ray photons was transferred to the electrons. This transfer of energy resulted in a change in the wavelength of the scattered X-rays. Now, this change in wavelength was a key revelation. It indicated that the X-rays, typically thought of as waves, were behaving more like particles in their interaction with the electrons. This observation supported the idea that light possesses both wave-like and particle-like properties, contributing significantly to the development of quantum theory. From a mathematical standpoint, Compton's experiments involved the conservation of energy and momentum, which are fundamental principles in physics. The change in wavelength, known as the Compton shift, is quantified by a formula that indicates constants like Planck's constant and the speed of light. Compton's work on understanding the particle nature of light earned him the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1927. His experiments not only confirmed the existence of photons, but also provided tangible evidence for the coexistence of wave and particle behaviors in light. This phenomena, known as Compton scattering, has far-reaching implications. Beyond its theoretical significance, Compton scattering finds applications in various fields, including medical imaging and material science. One common example of Compton scattering in medicine is in the field of medical imaging, specifically in X-ray imaging. When X-rays are used for diagnostic imaging, they are directed towards the body. As X-ray photons pass through the tissues, they may undergo Compton scattering interactions with electrons in the atoms of the tissues. During Compton scattering, some of the X-ray photons lose energy and change direction due to the collision with the electrons. In X-ray imaging, detectors pick up the scattered X-rays, and the information is used to create detailed images of the internal structures of the body. The scattered X-rays contribute to the overall image, providing valuable information about the composition and density of the tissues being examined. The degree of scattering can be influenced by the type of tissue, and this information is crucial for diagnostic purposes. This application of Compton scattering in medical imaging allows healthcare professionals to visualize bones, organs, and other structures inside the body, aiding in the diagnosis and treatment of various medical conditions. It is an essential tool in areas such as radiography, computed topography, CT scans, and fluoroscopy, providing valuable insights into the health and condition of patients. Another type of light scattering we know of is the so-called Rayleigh scattering. It is what makes our sky the color it is. Picture this. You have sunlight beaming through the atmosphere, and it encounters tiny particles like molecules and atoms. Now, these particles can influence the path of the light in different ways. Rayleigh scattering scatters short wavelengths such as blue and violet. When sunlight hits these particles, they spread the shorter wavelengths in all directions. That's why the sky looks blue during the day. Those shorter blue wavelengths get scattered more. Rayleigh scattering predominantly occurs in the Earth's atmosphere, influencing the color of the sky and contributing to the chromatic spectacle observed during sunrise and sunset. This phenomenon primarily involves shorter wavelengths, notably blue and violet light, dispersing in various directions due to interactions with atmospheric particles. Conversely, Compton scattering emerges in scenarios involving higher energy electromagnetic radiation, such as X-rays. This process entails a more intricate interaction between light particles and electrons, resulting in the exchange of energy and a modification in the trajectory of the scattered light. To draw an analogy, Rayleigh scattering can be likened to a casual and pervasive atmospheric phenomena, shaping the ambiance of the sky. In contrast, Compton scattering is analogous to a rigorous and high-energy event occurring in a controlled environment, like a physics laboratory. 
Despite their disparate nature, both phenomena contribute valuable insights into the behavior of light under distinct circumstances. Temporal Double Slit Experiment Let's think again about the coolest experiment with light, the double slit experiment. It showed that light can act like both a wave and a particle. Now, in 2023, scientists at Imperial College did something neat. They found a way to separate the slits, not in space, but in time. Here's how they did it. They used a see-through material called indium tin oxide, found in phone screens. When they shot a laser at it and quickly changed the material from see-through to reflective, it created a super short window, just a few femtoseconds, where the laser bounced back. They called this a time slit. When they sent two laser pulses through these time slots, one after the other, something weird happened. Even though everything else, like where the light came from and where it was going, stayed the same, the second pulse caused an interference pattern. This pattern wasn't like the usual ones you see in the double slit experiment in regular space. Instead, it affected the laser's color. To understand why this might be happening, let's picture the experiment in time. Imagine a graph where space is on the left, right, and time is up down. The first layer leaves and hits the time slit, bounces back and reaches the receiver. Now a second laser is released and it reflects to the receiver at a slightly later time, a bit higher on our time graph. If light behaved normally, just going at its usual speed, that would be the end of it. But instead, light seems to be messing with itself. It's like it's taking a path that goes through both slits, not just its own. This is the only way it could create the pattern we see. Now here's the strange part. It's not how bright or dim the light is that's changing, but its color. Think of light as little packets of waves, and when you change the angle they come in, it messes with how often the peaks in the waves show up. This changes the color we see from red to blue. But what's even stranger is what's happening with the paths of this light through time. Some parts of the journey seem to make the light go slower than it should, taking more time to get to the same place. Other parts make it look like the light is going faster than it's supposed to. It's almost like it's traveling backward in time. This might sound a bit mind-bending, but according to the research from Imperial College in London, this is what's going on. It challenges what we thought we knew about how light works in the dimension of time. The Probabilistic Nature of Reality a thought experiment. Here's the deal. When we try to observe light, it's like catching it playing hide and seek. It decides to be all discrete and quantized, snapping to specific values. No one really knows why it does that. It's a cosmic mystery. Think about a wave. You could imagine chopping it in half, right? Well, not with light. On the teeny tiny quantum scale, light refuses to be halved no half photons allowed and definitely not one and a half photons. It prefers to be all mysterious and probabilistic, acting like a wave when no one is watching, only to decide on a definite answer when someone finally asks. Now here's where it gets even weirder. Picture light as guitar strings playing harmonics. Only certain waves are allowed. There's a limit to how it can wiggle and jiggle. But what's pinching the ends of its path? No one knows for sure, it's like a magical force that makes light behave in its quirky way, and the details are still a cosmic puzzle. Now hold on tight, because this quirkiness isn't about light. A simple thought experiment leads us to the conclusion that if light, the energetic performer, dances probabilistically, then maybe all the particles around us do the same funky dance. Yep, everything, atoms, molecules, even electrons, they're all partying to the beats of probability when you zoom in. So here's the big question. What's the cosmic DJ playing? What's the secret behind this dance of matter and energy? Why does the universe put on a different show when we're watching compared to when we're not? The truth is, we're in a bit of a cosmic dice game. The universe seems to enjoy keeping things uncertain, making you and everything around you a bit more unpredictable than you might have guessed. One thing's for sure, when it comes to light, the cosmic joke is on us. It loves to keep us guessing showing off its dual nature as a particle or a wave, depending on whether we're paying attention or not. As we wrap up our adventure into the world of light experiments, isn't it fascinating how much we've learned about this friendly glow? From the funny behavior of particles to the magical creation of holograms, we've had quite a journey. But guess what? 
Light is like a never-ending story that scientists and curious folks like you and me keep exploring. There's still so much we don't know. It's like a big puzzle waiting to be solved. So as we finish our light-filled ride, let's think about this. What other cool things are out there waiting for us to discover under the glow of light? The universe is like a giant playground of mysteries and who knows what's next? Keep wondering, keep asking questions, and who knows what awesome things about light in the universe are still hiding in the shadows? The adventure never ends and the light of discovery keeps shining bright. That's all for this video. What would you like us to cover next? Feel free to share your thoughts in the comments below and stay tuned for our next video. I'll see you soon on the channel.